wherever you are, my 480 affiliates, or you're watching on the Salem News Channel, listen to this. The officials in the booth have reversed the call on the field about Wednesday night's debate. And my call. I originally said President Trump lost the battle, but may won the war and probably the election. I believe after a full day of absorbing reactions and studying the debate across the spectrum, that Donald Trump won that debate and won the election. And I will want to tell you why. Uh, as I will say to Larry Kudlow later, first reports are often wrong. It's a cliche in the news, and it's, you hear it a lot. The first reports were not good for Trump. But it then began to sink in how bad the debate moderators had manipulated, how biased ABC Disney was. My new Fox News column this morning is entitled Morning Glory, The Worst Debate in the History of Presidential Debates. And I'll come back to that. But let's not just rely on me or Fox News. Let's start with CNN, cut number 26, David Chalian, one of the really smart people over at CNN. Said this the about economy the here, uh, who, would you, who would better handle the economy is what we ask. Going into the debate, before the debate, 37% said Harris, 53% Trump. After the debate, again, margin of error stuff here, but numerically she lost a little ground. 35% said so after the debate that she would better handle the economy. 55% said Trump, and we know that is one of his strongest suits across the polling in this election. And he seemed to hang on to that piece in this debate tonight, according to our poll of debate watchers. And now, all the polls of debate watchers, that's all first stuff. What really happened all day yesterday was it settled in. ABC and Disney fixed the debate. It was an ambush of Trump. And by the time I got on Kudlow's show yesterday afternoon at 4 p.m., I was pretty certain what had happened. Cut number 20, this is when I joined Larry and uh, uh, Katie Pavlik and the editor of Breitbart at Large. Here is cut number 20. Hugh Hewitt, your take on any of this. Well, I, I want to say kudos on your riff, Larry, because the oldest cliche in news is also true. First reports are usually wrong. Wow, and the you. first reports last night are that, you know, Trump lost, Harris won. Over the course of the day, I have been seeing three things emerge. Trump was okay. Not his best, but he mm -hmm. did get in some haymakers. Mm -hmm. His closing statement was best. And anytime you're focusing on migration, you're winning. Kamala Harris, by contrast, was at her best, and it wasn't very good. And then third, and I think this matters a lot, it was the worst presidential debate in modern history. <laughs> I do not believe even an independent or even a moderately fair Democrat will conclude other than that was an ambush. And as that settles in, as people study what Alex just referred to, the vice president did not answer one question. Nor did ABC, which is owned by Disney, ask one question about China. Not mm. one question. Mm. I was thinking of their theme parks, their merchandising. Yep. I think about the NBA. I didn't talk about China. Mm. Not one question about Iran. They did not bring up our hostage who was executed along with five others mm. in Israel on the 10th seven. I am so amazed at the unprofessionalism. And the, the deeply disrespectful of America, as Katie mentioned, performance by ABC, I think by the weekend, Trump may have won this. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a moving river of opinion that gathers force. And at this point, yeah, I, I wanted more. I wanted perfection. But that was the best the vice president's ever going to be. And she's not very good. The weaponization of lawfare is well known and resented by a vast majority of Americans. The weaponization of primetime media has never been seen that nakedly before, and it's having impact. One more cut from Kudlow, cut number uh, 21. Chief Hewitt, regarding foreign policy, you were mentioning China, which never came up, which is almost tragic. But I thought that, um, I thought Mr. Trump punched away pretty good on the catastrophe in Afghanistan, and Hugh, how that, um, you know, you could connect the dots from that Afghanistan con uh, catastrophe into uh, Putin, Russia invading Ukraine. Uh, I don't know, you are a foreign policy expert, among other things. Do you think Mr. Trump made those points? He began to. He said, look, we had an agreement. It was a condition-based agreement. Mike Pompeo negotiated. They broke the conditions. We were not going to withdraw. You did withdraw. It was catastrophic. 
He could have gone on then to the Arlington Cemetery controversy, and he didn't. But generally speaking, that was very good. Mm. The difficulty is, I'm a lawyer, Kamala Harris is a lawyer. I've been a law professor for 27 years. We're very good at saying nothing at great length. That's what she did. Donald Trump is a developer. <laughs> he can smell a rat in about five <laughs> seconds. And he knew there was an ambush after mm. the second question on abortion, mm. and he got mad. He can't get mad. Larry, you work for him. He can't get mad right. because then he rushes, right. and that's unfortunate. That, that, that is true. But it's not just me. It's not just Fox News. It's not just CNN's uh, David Shelley. Jake Tapper, by the end of the day, is, is saying this to America on CNN. Okay, so Fox News was hammering ABC all day long. But cut number 28, Jake. Vice President Harris began the debate by punting the first question on the economy. Do you believe Americans are better off than they were four years ago? So I was raised as a middle class kid, and I am actually the only person on this stage who has a plan that is about lifting up the middle class and working people of America. It went on from there. Despite the economy being the number one issue facing the country, the sitting vice president generally reverted to talking points about a few of her policy proposals. Even Harris allies today are saying that she needs to talk more about what she will do for Americans if elected. Senator Bernie Sanders will be here in a second to talk about more about the need for her to fill in some of those blanks. On the border, another vulnerable issue for Harris, she also dodged. Would you have done anything differently from President Biden on this? So I'm the only person on this stage who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations for the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. Okay, that wasn't the question. When asked how she would break through the Israel-Hamas war stalemate, Harris said this. We need a ceasefire deal and we need the hostages out. And so we will continue to work around the clock on that. Okay, but again, how? Okay, that's Jake Tapper. That's CNN. All right. Media uh, polls are impacted over time. Usually it takes seven to ten days to see it. I think Trump's going to end up winning this debate in the minds of the public out of disgust with ABC. Disgust. Donald Trump was okay, not at his best, but okay, got in some very good ones, and they talked a lot about the border crisis and the impacts on community like Springfield, Ohio. Kamala Harris was at her best. It wasn't very good. Here is the beginning of my column this morning, my morning glory column, which I write for Fox News on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Not one question Wednesday night about the execution of Hearst Goldberg Pollen and five other hostages two weeks ago, or about any of the Americans murdered by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. Not one question on Iran, which is in weeks of acquiring a nuclear weapon and which is paying and perhaps precisely directing repeated attacks by its proxies on American forces in the Gulf of Arabia, the Red Sea, Iraq, or Jordan. Not one question about the capacity of President Joe Biden to continue as president. And not one single question about the People's Republic of China, its genocide against the Uyghurs, its oppression of Hong Kong, its threat against Taiwan or the Philippines, or its military buildup, the largest, most expensive peacetime military buildup in history. Perhaps ABC's parent Disney put the kibosh on questions that would upset the People's Republic of China and endanger the company's theme parks in the country or the release of its movies in China. Who knows? But ABC and Disney made time for a long exchange on abortion rights, which have been discussed again and again and again in this campaign, and for an idiotic exchange on regrets. I've had a few, but then again, too few questions from the moderator David Muir to Trump about January 6th. There are at least four, and other people say six, five, five maybe, moderator interventions or rebukes disguised as, quote, fact checks of former President Donald Trump. None, none of Vice President Kamala Harris. The bias pulse. It could be felt by everyone. Democrats and leftists cheered. Republicans were first shocked and then outraged. The column goes on. Bottom line, upon further review, the officials in the booth, which includes me, have reversed the call on the field, which included mine, on immediately after the debate that Trump may have lost that. No, I don't think so. I think the weaponization of the media, like the weaponization of the Department of Justice, has blown back against the Democrats. And by next week, you'll see Trump's lead 
get larger. First, let me tell you about AmericanFederal.com, one of our sponsors, and the market report and what it tells us. American Federal sells you gold. AmericanFederal.com or call 800-221-7694, 800-221-7694. Krugerrands, gold, uh, uh, maple leaves, Canadian gold maple leaves, one ounce. They can sell you a half ounce, a quarter ounce, or they can sell you gold bars. Whatever they want, whatever you want to buy, they will sell you. The commission goes down as the amount of the purchase goes up. They'll also buy your gold, right? You're up against the wall, they'll buy your gold. Gold this morning is at $2,547 an ounce because even a tiny prospect of Kamala Harris winning spooks people. And so gold went up yesterday. Good day to sell your gold to Nick Grovich, uh, 1-800-221-7694. But when you buy gold, you ought to do on a dollar cost average basis, meaning the same amount of gold or the same amount of money of gold at a regular occurring time. That's my proposal. I do it once a year and call up Nick uh, and I'm, that's my plan. Your plan is your plan. I'm just telling you for the last 100 years, gold has more than kept pace with inflation. And the pros, the real pros, are Nick Grovich and his team at American Federal, 800-221-7694. Now, I say the markets are smart every day on this show, and they're smarter than me. That's why I have gold, dirt, Mutual funds and three stocks, Amazon, Microsoft, and Palantir. I just like to watch three stocks. But I I do watch the market every day because Nick Grovich sponsors a market report. The markets were down in the futures, and they roared back yesterday. Why? Because at the end of the day, they figured out Trump had won the debate. Yesterday, the Dow closed, closed up 124. The S&P closed up 58. The NASDAQ closed up 396. And as I said, gold went up, 2,547. That's the hedge against Kamala Harris winning. But the market, by the end of the day, it started out way down and then ended up way up because by the end of the day, they had come around to the view that upon further review, the officials in the booth had reversed the call in the field. And they realized Kamala Harris came off as vapid. That was the best she can do. She memorized some lines, as Mike Gallagher said to me. And it's not very good. It's bad, in fact. That wasn't the best that Trump can do, and it was good enough, and he focused on migration. So by the end of the day, the markets got bullish on America because Trump means the American economy comes back. It's that simple. Never, never doubt the market. Morning glory, the worst debate in the— in, Oh, there's a power outage in Pittsburgh. They, you see, I think they're trying to just completely destroy Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania is going against them in the election. That's not true, but— um, uh, Generalissimo, since uh, we're waiting for Kamala, uh, since we're waiting, we'll always be waiting for Kamala. Since we're waiting for Selena, yeah. can we get her up on the phone? Yeah, I was got... just going to ask you if you want me to get her on the phone. Oh, yeah, get her up on the phone. I'll talk to her. If they've got a power outage, she, she can't do the video, but I'll talk to her on the phone. Right. Um, Dwayne's World, when's the next one drop? Uh, the next one will drop uh, first thing in the morning, and we will tape it probably early afternoon uh, West Coast time. So, you know, drive time uh, tonight, East Coast time, to reflect on whatever the news of the day was today. So it'll be fresh in the morning. Okay, good. I, I just, I cannot wait to hear what your second take is, because the second takes are like, I, I think they're going to be like mine. Uh, I'll hear from Noah Rothman a little bit later. Mike Rogers running for Senate. We're going to have two senators on today, Senator Blackburn, Senator Scott. Jim Talent will be along. I think Dr. Orrin is in the States and will talk to me today. It, anyway, seems, I, it's, I, it, it seems to me that, you know, what we were thinking and maybe wish casting a little a couple of days ago, which is the American people are going to see through what a, a, a nightmare the debate was and how badly moderated it was. We were hoping the American people were going to see that, but we didn't have any empirical evidence. We actually may be starting to see that now. Well, I will, by the end of the day, but I'm glad that you're not taping Dwayne's World until later in the day, because I think it's going to accumulate today. I think so, too. And and so we will see that. Uh, I I have got, look, you can always find out my Fox News column by doing Fox News and Hugh Hewitt at Google. You can also find it at HHS Links, and I will usually read the entire thing on the air. And as we wait for Selena, I will, I will start to read that for you so you can, you can get it. Morning Glory, the worst presidential debate in the history of presidential debates. 
That's the title. Subtitle, ABC and Disney disgraced themselves. Disgraced themselves and exposed themselves. Republicans and fair-minded independents will never forget. Not one question Wednesday night about the execution of Hirsch, Goldberg, Pollen, and five other hostages two weeks ago, or about any of the Americans murdered on October 7th by Hamas. Not one question on Iran, which is in within, within weeks of acquiring a nuclear weapon, and which is paying and perhaps precisely directing repeated attacks. Oh, I've got Selena, thank goodness. Selena Zito, good morning, how are you? I don't have any. I don't have any electricity. Well, it is. It is Pennsylvania. <laughs> it is Pennsylvania. So you know, stuff breaks. Yeah. Uh, Selena Zito, um, my my began the show by saying, uh, upon further review, the officials in the booth have reversed the call on the field concerning the debate. My call was Trump lost the debate but won the war because they talked about migration. But as the day went on, I came to believe. ABC was so monstrously biased that people are mad at the weaponization of the media and ambush media. I think Trump may end up winning, going away because of that (laughs) debate. What did you hear in around your circle and throughout Pennsylvania yesterday in the aftermath of the debate? Well, I watched it in a bar, first of all. So that kind of helped me have a reality check. Uh, it's never good to be a reporter and watch it in the debate room with other reporters because everyone has the same opinion. Um, and you want to have it from the viewpoint of the people that are actually going to decide the election. And to your point, um, you know, the initial reaction, and I think it remains the same, she she may have won in terms of, you know, she outperformed expectations. But in terms of winning any new votes over, uh, that that did not happen. And in terms of earning new votes, I think ABC is the one, to your point, that blocked that ability. Um, I was I was sitting with a gentleman who, you know, he he was talking. He goes, "Look, I I don't I don't personally like Trump," and and we've all heard that scenario, right? He said, you know, I just don't like his comportment. Uh, It just grates on me. However, as I I am someone who has struggled to get ahead uh, in my in my uh, career, and a lot of it had to do with not my abilities, but because I had forces working against me. And and you know, he goes, you know, whatever the, the the landscape is in my industry. It's it's always fraught with a lot of politics. Is not not you know uh, American politics, but you know what you're willing to do for the job. And when I watch them, as I'm watching the uh, the moderators, you know, try to get in the way of him having any success, I'm getting pissed. Yep. And I and 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 it's pulling me towards him. He goes, and I don't. He goes, this is very hard for me to admit. But this you is, know, this is a boomerang effect that we often see when, like, lawfare worked to Trump's benefit. Right? People yeah. realize this is not fair. Now, media has been weaponized by ABC, and I think Disney told them, don't bring up China. We got theme parks there. I mean, I really do think that happened, because not one question on China. Isn't that kind of stunning? Yeah. It it, it was, well, the lack of depth of questioning on the, um, the, the inflation was just basically criminal. And and Iran's going to get a nuclear weapon. We've been talking about that in presidential debates since 2000. And they didn't ask. Okay, Selena, I got to get to this. Uh, you, you're your own editor. I hope you tell me what's going on in Springfield, because, Ohio, because I don't trust anyone. I do trust Attorney General David Yost of Ohio, who posted yeah, this they, yesterday yeah. at 9.38 a.m. There is a recorded police call from a witness who saw immigrants capturing geese for food in Springfield. Citizens testified to the city council. These people would be competent witnesses in court. Why does the media, he means ABC here, find a carefully worded city hall press release better evidence? I, I, that's the attorney general of Ohio 
side swiping ABC News for so-called I talk to the city manager stuff. Have you been to Springfield? I didn't know 20,000 Haitians had been dropped on this town of 58,000 people in the last three years. Yeah, uh, I did know about this uh, in terms of knowing about the um, uh, the uh, them being brought there. They're also brought to a small town right here in western Pennsylvania um, called Charleroi. I have not been to either, but, uh, you know, those are my weekend plans. I'm starting in Charleroi and then going to Springfield. Good, because if I were one of your editors, I would want 3,000 words on Springfield. Because all of us, I, I mean, this is how debates backfire on people who fix debates. Uh, you make, uh, David Muir, you contradict the former president of the United States, and you contradict all the media stories about the pets and the dogs and people complaining. Then you get the attorney general of Ohio rebuking you, and then you get Selena Zito going and follow, file, filing one of the most popular columns in America on Springfield, and all of a sudden you got egg on your face. Does Muir and Lindsey Davis ever recover from this, Selena? I mean, will anyone ever uh, trust them again? That was a that was a Candy Crowley moment. And where is Candy Crowley today? Upper Nobody. Pen, upper Peninsula. She retired to Min uh, Michigan, but she retired early. Uh, before this, you know, Candy had one bad moment. I like Candy. Candy's been a friend for years. Yeah. Uh, I kind of like. I know Chris Wallace to nod at him. Uh, of all the funniest places to meet him, I met him in the Senate dining room once. That's the only time I ever met him. But uh, I, I'll tell you this. He had the worst debate performance. He's the happiest man in America because he blew the first Trump-Biden debate badly. He, lost, he just totally lost control. This, they didn't lose control. They just manipulated the house. This is so scripted. This is so, I've done five of these, right, with primary debates. And I've worked with CNN four times, NBC. This is all scripted, Selena. None of that was by accident. No, no, of course none of that was by accident because their editors, um, uh, you know, had a heavy hand in maybe not originating the questions, but certainly guiding oh. them, refining oh, them. Oh, Selena, I, them. Yes. I, they do originate the question. I've been there. Uh, the NBC oh, okay. uh, the, the NBC process had 50 people working on it. day one through four was here are the questions we think you should ask. And I said, no, 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 no. Here are the questions I'm going to ask. Let's work my questions workshop because I don't want to ask a bad question. I appreciate input and my questions changed. And then we decide where they're going to go. And the talent from the networks don't come up with questions. The executive producer is the lead, but the head of ABC News, the head of ABC, and I guarantee Bob Iger was in there somewhere, if not in presence, in phone calls. Because not asking about China, let's, let's close there. I, I'm convinced Disney told ABC, you cannot destroy our business in China by bringing up what happens if they attempt to invade Taiwan. Oh, I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. It's criminal that China wasn't mentioned. I mean, the three, the three biggest issues for the voter, which is inflation, immigration, and where does fentanyl come from? China. Oh, you know How what? You're right. Ask? You're right. There, there are 110,000 American families in the last year wondering, what are you going to do about fentanyl in China and Mexico? And it didn't get asked. Right. I mean, it, you know, it comes through the border, but it's made in China and Precursors. they bring it to Mexico and it comes across the border. I got to ask you as well, Hirsch Goldberg pollen, you know, Tree of Life Synagogue is in Pittsburgh attacked by an ex far right extremist. And we covered that rightfully for a long time. Hirsch Goldberg pollen executed in cold blood 10 days ago. He's an American. He's also an Israeli citizen. Uh, not a word. Not a word. Many Americans killed on 10-7. I, 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 and this debate occurred on the eve of 9-11. And there was a terrorist caught coming in. Not a word about terrorism. I, I just can't get over how bad that debate was. Selena, last word the, to you. The, the debate was terrible. And this is probably why I'll never be picked to be a moderator. Because if someone took my questions, and the questions would be about the people that I cover and the people that, that, that and the things that the American people care about, and told me, no, we're going to talk about this, uh, I, w I would have said, well, uh, I can't do this because nobody cares about what you're talking about. And, and I feel, and, and that was the overall 
a sentiment I receive from people in the bar. They're like, why are they even asking these questions? Yeah. Do you have any regrets about January 6th? What a stupid, stupid question. And I'll, I'll tell you, I know from firsthand experience how this happened. Joined by Dr. Michael Lauren, who is back in the States. I erroneously posted on X this morning. I was going to talk to him from Israel, but I'm glad he gets up early. Dr. Oren, I, I want one focus today on the North because uh, heavy bombardments yesterday is, and Yoav Gallant said, we're turning our attention to the North. Is a full-scale offensive coming? Um, I hope so. That's. I hope so. You know, hope, I hope is not a strategy. A Do they have a strategy? Well, well, <laughs> let me let me put it this, let me put it more emphatically. It's this. There's, right now, there's no alternative, and I'll explain why there's no alternative. It's not just that there's a hundred thousand Israelis who've been rendered whole, homeless. The entire north is uninhabitable. Dozens of people have been killed and wounded. It's that you can't go back to the status quo ante of October sixth. On October sixth, if you were living in one of the many Israeli communities along the northern border, you could stick your finger through the fence, and I wouldn't recommend you do this. And you could you could touch Hezbollah. They were right there. Now, right, no one is going to go back to those communities if Hezbollah is sitting on the fence, because now we know what terrorists can do when they're sitting on the other side of the fence. All right? They'll break through the fence, and they'll come and behead you and, and burn you and rape your, your wife and, and drag your children into captivity. Uh, no one's going to do it back to do that. So if Israel wants to maintain, uh, or regain, rather, its, ter- its territorial integrity, its sovereignty, you have no choice. And, now, Dr. Warren, uh, I, I like to remind my audience, you're a tank guy. You were in the IDF no, in a tank. No. Aren't you a tanker? Pa- I wish. I, were. I hate tanks. Uh, I was ah! a paratrooper. I was a paratrooper. Oh, okay. I was, oh, uh, I didn't know that. I, okay. I, I have many, many jumps to my credit. Though. I must say I never jumped. I was always pushed out. <laughs> All right, so, so you're a paratrooper. My question is, if Israel goes on the offensive, do they have to go all the way to Beirut in order to make sure the missiles can't fire from it? Do they have to go to Baqa? Do they have to go in, even in, maybe into Syria? Because the, I, I'm glad Hamas did not have precision ballistic missiles or they would have used them, but they're all over Lebanon. Oh, there's no question. We're talking the, the IDF estimate from rocket fire just from Lebanon is as much as 6,000 rockets a day. Right, we're talking about, remember, on, on April 14th, Iran, fired 350 projectiles at us. We're talking about many, many times that. That's just Lebanon. It's not the uh, Iranian militias in Syria and Iraq. It's not the Houthi rebels in Yemen. And it's not Iran itself. And so we're talking about a a war of a massive uh, magnitude, much, much bigger than anything we experienced in Gaza. We're talking about a national war. And but I'm saying this not with any glee. I'm telling you, it, it, we don't see any choice right now. Yeah, uh, no alternative. I agree. Because Hezbollah has, is, is, is engaging us in the ultimate, ultimate Israeli nightmare, which is a war of attrition. All right? Israel can't win a war of attrition. And it's a creeping war of attrition, Hugh. Every day, the rockets grow in number. They grow in terms of their range. They go further south, further west, towards major cities like Haifa. Uh, And that's basically, that's an existential threat to the state of Israel. And it's interesting, here's an interesting statistic, that the great majority of the people who are out there protesting to end the war in Gaza are in favor of pursuing the war against Hezbollah, because they know there's no choice. So, Dr. Oren, first, I apologize on behalf of American media. I don't work for ABC. I've appeared on ABC often. I don't work for them. They did not mention Hirsch Goldberg, Paul, and the other five hostages who were executed 10 days ago on the debate Wednesday night, nor did they ask about Iran's nuclear weapon, nor did they ask about the other Americans murdered by Hamas on 10 se- It was a disaster of a debate, a debacle for American media. I want to ask you, do you think if uh, Israel goes into Lebanon and Iran respond, will the American carriers get involved? Well, one of those carriers is steaming home as we speak, the Roosevelt. Okay. So it's not getting involved. So um, you're down to the Lincoln. So they're down to Lincoln. And, uh, and yes, they will get involved. They get involved in a defensive way, just as they did on April 14th, uh, taking down the rockets. The big question will be, what happens if, and I say this with a big, big if and a great sense of regret, one of those rockets hits, hits the Lincoln. What will be America's response? And that is a scenario that is not beyond uh, the imagination by any means. If those of us who are old enough to remember the Sheffield in 1982 and the Falklands War, that takes you know one one rocket. And what will be America's response? Will America then respond offensively, not just defensively? 
I have family on the Lincoln, so I can't answer that, Michael. I I know what my response would be. I know what my response would be, but no one will listen to me. Uh, There are 5,000 people on the Lincoln. But then again, 5,000 people were killed or wounded on 10-7, and this media has forgotten it. I don't I don't think we would forget 5,000 people on the link. I think it would be war with Iran. It better be war okay. with Iran. But that's 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 precisely what the administration is afraid of. That is the scenario I've just told you is, is their nightmare scenario. You know, especially specifically before the election. So, you know, there you have it. And uh, you know, it, it, it their trigger. You know, I, I think it's I think it's kind of uh, risable that that people in the administration said they're afraid of getting dragged into a regional war. But well, we've been in a regional war since you know since October yeah, 7th. Yeah, we are. We are. And uh, and and you know, America is is already in it. The question is, you know, you could look at this as, a, as an immense opportunity. I'm going to say something very controversial. Brace yourself. Right? You know, Israel doesn't have strategic bombers. We don't have B-52s, B-1s, B-2s. Right. Uh, we have these wonderful little things called uh, F-15s, F-16s, F-35s, which are wonderful airplanes, but they're small, and they have limited range and very limited payloads. America has these bombers. America can do away with Iran and Iran's nuclear program in a matter of hours from 50,000 feet, and nobody can touch it. Joined by Noah C. Rothman. That's where you'll find him on X at National Review, the editor's podcast all over the place. Frequently seen on many news stations and one of my favorite guests. Noah, you are a victim of the guest who went before you. All right. Dr. Oren, ambassador from Israel to the United States for many, many years, paratrooper, serious man, says Israel's got to go into Lebanon and that it is possible, not likely, but possible that Hezbollah's missiles could strike, maybe even sink, the USS Lincoln. Iran certainly could. Not likely, possible. If that happened, what would be the response of the United States? I would hope the United States would respond with overwhelming force, not just against Hezbollah targets, but Iranian targets, military targets, Um, both inside the country and outside the country. We should not make some sort of cosmetic distinction between Hezbollah and their sponsors in Tehran. Uh, Hezbollah doesn't move without Tehran say so. And if they were to take that kind of offensive action, again, directly against the United States, we would be at war with Iran. Thank you. We agree. I like it when I agree with Noah, because sometimes we disagree, and that's okay, but I like when we agree. Number two, I read his story at the uh, break. I, I Really, I cannot believe he did this. I respect Admiral Kirby. I have met him once. He is a patriot. He is a vet. Yesterday, he sent an email to his staff, which unfortunately for him, He included reply all, the most dangerous thing in the world, and it went to Fox News in which he said there's no use in responding to the handful of events of veterans who are talking about Afghanistan because they're just a handful of vets and indeed they are, quote, all of one stripe, close quote. Should he resign? That's a tough question. Um, I didn't serve. I cannot speak to how non-coms talk about enlisted men who are of lower rank, maybe that's how they talk about them. Um, But it's certainly unprofessional, certainly disrespectful. And should he resign his post is a question, I think, for his superiors and perhaps for himself. But certainly, if I was his superior, I'd put him on the back burner for a while. This is a comms guy. He's a public face of the State Department, and he can no longer serve. No, uh, National Security Council. National Security Council. He did that National Security Council. All right, yeah, Noah, yeah. I, now I don't know what we, I don't know I'm not going to talk about, I know what you think about Trump and Harris in the debate, I listened. What I do not know is what you think about isolated ABC News' performance, and specifically the, the failure to ask one question about China and whether or not you think Disney, which has two theme parks and a lot invested in China, is behind that vacuum on Tuesday night? Well, that's a good question. And it's sort of a broad question, right? I mean, we're not just talking about Disney in that sense. We're talking about all networks and all sponsors and all the conglomerates that have investments in them and the fiduciary responsibility those networks therefore have to their investors. And can they operate as neutral media arbiters of our domestic political discourse? I mean, that applies universally at this point. So it's a far broader problem with uh, significant implications. If you were to come to the conclusion that I I think you reach and perhaps I reach, I can't say one way or the other. 
I do not want to defend ABC News as moderators uh, because they do not deserve defending. But you can tell they tried to cram in an entire general election into an entire debate. And that's not normally how these things work, right? Especially when it comes to foreign policy. Traditionally, we have a debate dedicated to foreign policy questions because the world is a very big place and there's a lot of issues and it's very hard to cram them all into one thing. That being said, the omission of China as a significant foreign policy issue. And it, the thing is, Iran barely even came up and was came up via proxy when we're talking about Israel and Hamas. But it was Harris who brought up Iran precisely twice. And Donald Trump who talked about how they were um, bankrupted under his administration. But the fact that we have several active combat zones where the United States is under fire uh, in off the coast of Yemen, in Syria and Iraq, and off the coast of the Levant, um, where we're deterring Hezbollah, that should have been a, a very central focus, and it was not. China's omission is, well, th and again, Three very soldiers easy. were killed in Jordan. Three, third, three soldiers were killed in Jordan by Iraq, um, Iraqi Renee militias. Renee Blassett have by... not seen this kind of combat since World War II. Active yeah. duty. But, but Kamala um, Harris said that's not true. Kamala Harris said we yeah, have that, no one in harm's way. And that is as bad a mistake as Joe Biden made when he said that nobody had died. Uh, in combat in his administration, a profound insult, not just to the soldiers who passed when they were killed in that Jordanian outpost, but 13 Americans who died at Abbey Gate. Um, but you could attribute that to a brain fart, right? You can't, what do you attribute this to? This is just an administration talking point that simply sails over everybody's heads, I suppose. Uh, and we're not talking yeah, I, about I, soldiers who are who are on deployment in operations that happen to be hot. These are live combat zones dedicated to active missions. Uh, which have names and everything. So it re there really is very little excuse. Last question on the debate. Not one question Wednesday night. And I'm probably most shocked about this. It's what I led my new Fox News column with. China's bad. Iran's bad. The, everything we just talked about is bad. But this is shocking. Not one question Wednesday night about the execution of Hearst Goldberg Pollen and the other five hostages two weeks ago. I, I, I do not understand. I, I've done five of these debates. You yeah. rehearsed 12 times. The question teams is between 30 and 50 people. The head of ABC News was involved, probably the head of Disney, probably the head of the network. It's highly scripted. Everybody knows what they're going to ask. It's all laid out. Everybody knows what order it goes in. It's all, I've done it five times. They made a choice, Noah, not to mention Hirsch Goldberg Pollen. And I am outraged. Are you? Yeah, you should be. Um, an American soldier had a gun put to, the, or American citizen had a gun put to the back of his head by a terrorist organization sponsored by Iran and pulled the trigger. Americans should be furious, not just because of the abstract principle that Americans uh, should be inviolable abroad or they face the wrath of the United States. You yourself, if you find yourself in trouble abroad, expect to be abandoned by this administration, or expect to have your case uh, handled and, um, and, and maybe uh, achieve liberation if you happen to be in the, in the custody of, say, Moscow, uh, by releasing assets that are uh, of vital national interest to Russia uh, in exchange for your, for your freedom. Um, I think ABC News should have, probably the most egregious failure of ABC's moderators was when they asked Kamala Harris about the ceasefire question which was poorly framed because they said, look, there's no deal to be had because Netanyahu doesn't want a deal. That's not true. Hamas has rejected five of the last five ceasefire proposals, not Benjamin Netanyahu. But they pressed Kamala Harris on the ceasefire. Listen, how do you get a ceasefire if there's no deal to be done? And she says, well, we need a ceasefire. That's her answer, which is not an answer. It's an insult to our intelligence and no follow-up. Listen, I, I, I uh, Jake Tapper noted when Jake Tapper is telling people she she punted, she didn't answer any questions. Then, you know, she didn't answer any question. Let me the close. This up, way, Noah, doesn't, she doesn't answer her question. Yeah, they did it. A couple uh, let times me close here. They had no follow up. I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I have I did my monologue this morning. Upon further review, the officials in the booth have reversed the call on the field. On Tuesday night, I thought Trump had lost the battle, but maybe won the war because they were talking about migration and the economy a little bit. Upon further review, after yesterday and seeing the what I thought was 95% outrage with ABC, I think Trump's numbers may go up by seven days from now when the debate is fully baked in. What do you think? 
I, I don't know. I, I would be kind of surprised. The polling has been tightening recently, and it's not because Harris is doing worse. It's because Trump is doing better. He is reclaiming some of those voters who maybe had a dalliance with being undecided or possibly even looking at Harris's record. But media bias is something that you and I and people who pay very close attention to the press and the political cycle at a granular level notice. The voters who matter in this election are not those kind of voters. I would be surprised if they register what we understand to be uh, the media putting their fingers on on the scale and much less resent it. So possibly, but it would surprise me. All right, now I I can squeeze this in. David Yost, uh, the Attorney General of Ohio yesterday posted, there's a recorded police call from a witness who saw immigrants capturing geese for food in Springfield. Citizens testified to the city council. These people would be competent witnesses in court. Why does the media, he's talking about ABC, I talked to the city manager. Find a carefully worded city hall press release better evidence. Uh, Did you know about Springfield? 20,000 Haitians on a city of 58,000 people. I didn't even know about it until Tuesday night. No, I didn't. I I didn't know that. Well, I I didn't know. I I didn't know the scale of it, certainly. Uh, If Donald Trump had said in that moment, and by the way, the cats and the dogs line is the moment of the night, which is why it was a mistake. But if he had said geese, he would have been on very firm ground. The thing about it is nobody cares about geese. Geese are mean. They attack your children. They taste horrible. Nobody's going to have any sympathy for slaughtered geese. I'm not the only one who thought ABC News gave the worst presidential debate in history. Uh, Howard Kurtz was the best media critic in the world that is working currently. Said this yesterday on Fox News, cut 25. ABC gets a D minus, and that's being generous. In fact, the network's moderators were so blatantly biased against Donald Trump that indicated that his pregame criticism of ABC as dishonest, putting aside Kamala Harris's aggressive performance, uh, the moderators, David Muir and Lindsey Davis, asked much tougher questions of the former president, repeatedly followed up and corrected, as you said, uh, his responses on five occasions. For the vice president, the figure was zealot. For instance, when Harris was asked about her abandoning her previous left-wing positions on opposing fracking and uh, abolishing private health insurance, she danced around the questions uh, and uh, said that these things were untrue. She said things that were untrue with no fact-checking by ABC. The same goes for the VP's out-of-context charge that Trump had warned of a bloodbath if he loses. Now, when Harris said things that were false, such as that Trump is actively pursuing the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, which he has repeatedly disavowed, there was no challenge from ABC. Under Trump... Couples who pray and, 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 and dream of having a family are being denied IVF treatments. Actually, Trump has been a leading advocate of IVF treatments, even saying they should be free. But the former president was constantly pressed on whether he regrets anything he did on January 6th or whether he wants Ukraine to win the war against Russia. Now, there were times when the fact checking was appropriate, such as when Trump repeated, excuse me, a debunked claim that Haitian immigrants in Ohio were eating pets. But it was generally so one sided as to support Trump's complaint. The debate very much felt like three against one. Uh, it, it, it was three against one. Didn't feel like it, it was. I, uh, I also want, I want to just note, why are so many people in the media stupid about abortion? Ignorant. Late-term abortions happen every day in this country. They are legal in, I believe, nine states. Some people say five. And uh, partial birth abortions were banned by federal law, a particular procedure, but not late-term abortions. It's the only federal law that's ever passed on abortion. They'll, they'll never repeal it, much less put a new one through. And I've just, I've just got to say, Ralph Northam said, if an abortion is botched and a baby is delivered, we'll put it aside and we'll let it die. That's all true. But, you know, media won't, they won't absorb the facts. They don't want to deal with facts. Now, I had an argument with an unnamed person in the media, I don't rag on my colleague, who said, there, there aren't any. And I said, no, there are, there are. Well, there are very few. I said, how many do you think there are? And the individual didn't have an answer because it's an inconvenient truth for left-wing media that there are thousands. No, there are not tens of thousands. There are thousands every year 
late-term abortion, a few of those thousands are botched, and a baby ends up being born. A very few. Deal with the few. Deal with the few. Now, Michael Waltz got into it with Brianna Keeler on CNN yesterday, cut number 24. I will just note that when it comes to abortions after at or after 21 weeks, less than 1% account for that. And in a lot of those cases, it has to do with the life of the mother or it has to do with the extreme medical conditions of the fetus that it will not survive. Stop, stop, uh, stop. How many is the question? What is your source? Because they never have it. They never have it. I'm not even going to get that Congressman Waltz who said, hey, it's legal in nine states. He held up a Jonah Goldberg. He, he crushed her. But that's always what they say. Yeah, it's very rare. It doesn't happen. Life of the mother. That's true. But how many, where, what are you getting your stats from? Senator Marsha Blackburn represents Tennessee, where many of my listeners are located this morning. Good morning, Senator. Welcome. Always good to have you. It is always good to join you. Thank you. I've got four questions for you. First, uh, I began my show by saying, upon further review, the officials in the booth have reversed the call in the field. I thought on Tuesday night Donald Trump had lost the debate. But after thinking about it, watching a full day of outrage over ABC's moderation, which I'll come to, realizing that's the best Kamala Harris can do and seeing everyone agree she didn't answer any questions. I think he won, and I think the polls will show that. What do you think? I think that what we saw was three people ganged up on <clears throat> one person, and the moderators chose not to press her. They didn't question her. They didn't ask follow ons They did not fact check her. And when she would not answer the first question, which is, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And relating that to the American people, and she couldn't answer that. And here she goes into this word salad about growing up as a middle-class kid and um, experiencing a middle-class life. And I think people sort of glazed over because they said, wait a minute, inflation is killing us. You can't fill up the gas tank and the grocery cart in the same week. You want to say Bidenomics is wonderful and things are great? They're not great. And she asked that question. You know, we should ask if the American people are okay. Are you okay? The American people are not okay. And then she tried to say, it's time to move on. Well, she's been there for four years. So what is she moving on from? The American people are ready to move on from the Biden-Harris policies because they are tired of being broke. They are tired of seeing fentanyl kill kids in their communities. They are tired of gangs coming into their communities, recruiting kids, um, running up crime in communities. They are frustrated when they hear that there is not a resolute support of Israel and that our allies can't define if they're an ally. Our enemies don't fear us. They see Biden and Harris and Kamala Harris specifically as weak, failed, and dangerously liberal. I am going to come back to the debate in a moment, but first I have to ask you about Admiral Kirby, Deputy Press Secretary at the White House, uh, head of the National Security Council Press. I have met Admiral Kirby. I've always thought he was a patriot and respected him, but yesterday he hit reply all on an email uh, to his staff, which included, unfortunately for him and fortunately for us, Fox News, saying, no use responding to veterans who are complaining about the lack of attention to the dead in Afghanistan. They are a, quote, handful of vets and indeed all of one stripe. Close quote. All of one stripe. Don't respond, handful of veterans. Do you think he should resign? Yes, I, I do believe that he should resign. When you look at what is happening with the VA, under this administration. And of course, we have the PACT Act. And John Tester, out of Montana, who, by the way, is about to lose his seat in Montana, 
John Tester pushed forward on the PACT Act with people like me who are on the Veterans Affairs Committee saying, look, the VA cannot handle this. You have to implement community care so that our veterans can get the care that they need. Well, you know what? They push forward with this anyway. Right now today, the VA has a a backlog of one million cases for benefits and health care from our nation's wonderful, fabulous, patriotic veterans. Right. And well, they are not meeting that need. And yeah. Hugh, this is the lack of respect that they show for the military and our nation's veterans. And then you get that kind of response from John Kirby. I'm astonished by it. I think he should have been fired. But as President Trump said on Tuesday night, they don't fire anyone in this administration. Excuse me, Senator. Next, I have a new Fox News column this morning titled The Worst Presidential Debate in the History of Presidential Debate. ABC and Disney are disgraced and exposed uh, and that Republicans will never forget. I am curious, will you appear on ABC or answer an ABC reporter's question for the rest of this election or indeed ever? Because we got to punish them. They're Democrats. They are using the their news <clears throat> to opinion journalism. And I thought it was so very clear with the way they treated Trump, the questions that they asked, the way they coddled Kamala Harris and did not ask her, didn't drill down. Why have you changed your opinion? You... And bear in mind, they didn't even correct her that in 2020, she was not a presidential candidate. I know, but I want, I want to press you, Senator. I want, to, I want to press you. Will you appear on that network? Because I think no Republican should. Now, people will disagree with me, but I just think we ought to cut them off because it's not a news network. It is a propaganda arm of the Democrats. You, I have been very careful over the last few years when it comes to the mainstream media, and very seldom do I go on their shows. I used to do previously would do Meet the Press and Face the Nation and uh, State of the Union and all of these shows. But if you are going to go on and if they are going to ridicule you and ridicule your positions and they're not going to be fair and they're going to try to blindside you, why would you do that? There are so many ways to get your message out now. And people want to know what your policies are and what you're going to do because elections are all about them. And they're tired of elections being about people that are going to increase their taxes, that are going to take away their freedoms, that are going to give them less choice and options in their daily life. And they don't want to be sending their money to Washington, D.C. and paying for all of this that is supported by elitists in Washington, D.C. who want Washington, D.C. to control all the power. I'm going to take that as a no. But I want to ask you about Nora O'Donnell and Margaret Brennan, the CBS anchors for the vice presidential debate on October 1st. Do you trust them to be like Jake and Dana? who did a fine job in the first debate, or like yes, Muir and Davis, who did a terrible job. What do you think about O'Donnell and Brennan? Uh, let's uh, see what they do. Um, I, You know, I'm going to be hopeful that they're going to give a fair approach to their questions. If they fact-check one, let's fact-check the other. Uh, let's press for answers. If you're pressing one, uh, if Press the other. If you're asking follow-up on one, ask follow-up on the other. All right. Now, I want to close by talking about Springfield, Ohio. Uh, Yesterday, David Yost, the attorney general in Ohio, took to Twitter. And and I really am glad that he did because he's the attorney general from Ohio. And Springfield, Ohio came up in the debate last night. I'm looking for the exact statement because I don't want to get it wrong. I just reposted it, and and he watched the debate. Springfield came up, and he wrote, there's a recorded police call from a witness who saw immigrants capturing geese for food in Springfield. Citizens testified to the city council. These people should be competent witnesses in court. 
Why does the media find a carefully worded City Hall press release better than evidence? Uh, I didn't know what was going on in Springfield to the debate. That's why I think Donald Trump called attention to it. And a lot of people are mocking him for saying they're eating the dogs. But he got the attention on Springfield. They put 20,000 migrants from Haiti in a city of 58,000 in my home state of Ohio. I didn't know that until Tuesday night. Did you? No, I did not. I was not aware of that. So what do you think? What are they doing with this administration? You can't drop 20,000 people who may not even speak English into a small town in Ohio. It's stupid. But what they're doing is allowing individuals into the country. They use this parole program. They fly them into the country. And then they don't give any advance notice to local and state officials. And Senator Haggerty and I have had a bill now for the last three and a half years that would require the federal government to notify if they're going to go in and disrupt a neighborhood. And they pull, there is such a pull on resources. As I meet, with local officials in Tennessee, and I'm in every county in our state each year. And when you have um, children that are coming in, then you need English as a second language teachers. You have additional impact on your health care and those emergency services and health care services, social services have an impact. And, you know, Hugh, these are the costs that taxpayers in local communities end up paying for. And it is expensive. It's why Donald Trump's going to win. I'm I'm convinced he's going to win. Donald Trump is going to be the next president of the United States. And I think it was very telling with people who watched the debate, who listened to the word salad mix, from Kamala Harris, the avoiding questions and answers. And then they said, well, Donald Trump tells us the truth. Amen. And we might not always agree Amen. with him, but we know where he is going to land on issues. We can count on that. We were better off under Donald Trump. Thank you, Senator Marsha Blackburn. Keep coming back. Senator Jim Talent used to represent the state of Missouri. He's head of national security studies for the Reagan Institute. He's my friend, and you can follow him at Jim Talent on X. Jim, I got a lot of questions this morning, so we're going to lickety split. First of all, I began the show by saying, upon further review, the officials in the booth have reversed the call on the field, including my own. Donald Trump won that debate after 24 hours of seeing the reaction to ABC's bias and seeing the focus on... Uh, Ohio and the migrants and and just the overall reaction, I think he's going to move ahead in the polls. What do you think? Well, I think that the press being for Harris is one of the strongest tools that the Democrats have. So insofar as they undermine their credibility in the debate, which they clearly did, the effect of it in the intermediate term may well hurt the campaign. So I, I don't know you... Will, if she doesn't blip up in the polls by early next week, that's a very bad sign because she, su- she should, given that most of the coverage was that she won. So the simple reaction to that would normally cause a candidate to blip up a couple points. So I guess I'll wait to see what the polls yeah, say. The boomerang week. is what I'm counting on because lawfare didn't work. And I think media fair has become obvious. It's that, I, I got to ask my second question. I think it was the worst debate in the history of presidential debates. I wrote that today at Fox News. What do you think? Yeah, because, and, and, and by the way, I have to claim credit because I predicted this last week on Dwayne's World. I said yes, you I did. The moderators, I said I thought they would do everything possible to give her the election. And I want your, your viewers and listeners to understand that when you're doing a debate, obviously I've done a lot of high-profile debates. You have to decide. It's part of the job of the candidate to decide how much of your time to use making your points and how much of it to use attacking the misstatements uh, by your opponent. So when the moderator jumps in and does that job for the opponent, they are, in effect, participating in the debate. And that's what they did. And no, I have never seen a debate where that was done to that extent. It was, as other people have said, it was Candy Crowley 
you know, times five. And uh, it was it was disreputable on the part of ABC. You said it. And some people you- say some people have told me if you're arguing about the refs, you've lost the game. And I've said the game isn't over. I'm arguing about the refs and the game isn't even close to over. Next question. And this one is your specialty. There wasn't one question about China. I, I'm still stunned by this. Not one question about China. Do you think Disney, Bob Iger, told ABC, we got theme parks there. We got we saw a lot of merch in China. We can't go there. Because I, it's, it's unbelievable. It's like having a debate in 1940 and not talking about the Nazis. Yeah. Well, it's possible because we know the tentacles of the Chinese government. I mean, this is not some conspiracy theory. I mean, we've seen it in the last couple of weeks. So that's possible. It's possible if I wanted to be charitable to say that China is not on the front pages as of now, as often as what's happening in the Middle East, or probably the most likely explanation is that they ask as few questions about foreign policy as they could possibly get away with, because the Biden administration foreign policy, is in which, of course, she's participated and bragged about her participation, has been an utter and complete disaster. And, and they were going to off, they were going to ask as few questions that even had the potential for embarrassing her as they could possibly get away with. What I want to assure the audience, I've done five of these with networks, uh, presidential debates, primary debates, four with CNN, one with NBC. Everything is scripted. Everything in advance is worked over by everyone in the organization, not just Mira and Lindsay. It is everyone in ABC and indeed Disney. Next question has nothing to do with the debate. Yesterday, John Kirby mistakenly hit reply all and an email went out telling his staff there was no use in responding to a handful of vets who are upset about Afghanistan. They are all of one stripe. I, I, I like Admiral Kirby. I've met him once. He's a patriot. He's a veteran. And he should resign. What do you think, Jim Talent? Uh, if I were his boss, I think I would, because he's very able at his job, I think I would tell him I want an apology. I want it immediately. I want it personal. I want it on tape. And it better be good. Okay. But what really bothers me about it, I don't know that I would say he has to resign. What what really bothers me about it is it shows the bubble they're living in, that they believe the only veterans who are upset about what happened in Afghanistan are people who don't like the Democrats, who are Republicans. How John Kirby, with his his career and his record, can possibly believe that? It was an utter, absolute, dishonorable debacle that caused the death of of 13 Americans, the wounding of others, and the discrediting of of American credibility all over the world. But he thinks the only people who might complain about that are people who don't like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And what kind of bubble can he be in, you? That's the blue bubble. All right, Senator, I'm going to repeat. Attorney General Dave Yost, there's a recorded police call from witnesses who saw immigrants capturing geese for food in Springfield. Citizens testified to city council. These people would be competent witnesses in court. Why does the media find a carefully worded city press call release better evidence? I know Dave Yost. Dave Yost is a friend of mine. I've worked with Dave Yost. Uh, I I did not know anything about Springfield, Ohio, until the debate Tuesday night. I did not. I now know between 15 and 20,000 Haitians have been dropped into that city since Joe Biden took office. It's a city of 58,000 people. It's overwhelmed. Did you know anything about Springfield? And what do you think about David Yost's comment? Uh, I did not know about Springfield before. Of course, it was a, it was a, a, became a major issue because of the debate. And again, you this kind of thing, it, it, you have to ask yourself about the mindset of people who are surprised when when we allow millions and millions of people in from vastly different cultures who have vastly different ways of doing things. And then they find implausible that these people, when they come into the United States, would continue to do and to act the way they acted in their home countries. Of course they're going to do that. You know, you it's with regard to this border, it's of course a disaster that they allowed these people in. But again, what kind of people would, would open the border up, allow in millions, and have absolutely no plans for what you were going to do with them. 
And this is happening. Well, all of them, Democrats, it's, it's, that kind of yeah. people. Now, now, Jim, I, mean, I remember just, my brother-in-law worked on when the Vietnamese airlift happened, and there were tens of thousands of Vietnamese. The American government brought them to Camp Pendleton. They set up a tent village. They then slowly allowed them. My my parish in Warren, Ohio, adopted a Vietnamese family. They one family came to Warren, Ohio, and was integrated into the community with the support of one parish. It is possible to welcome the stranger and to take care of refugees, but it can't be 20,000 people on a city of 58,000 people. It ha- and it's happened all over the country. Of course it can. It's the reason why you control the border. I mean, look, even if, if you want a liberal immigration policy, and that's what we used to argue about, Hugh, you know, when I was in office, when I was running for, and this, isn't, this was not like in the dark ages, everybody agreed, you control the border and you stop illegal immigration. The issue was, there were two issues, how much legal immigration do you allow? And, and I certainly agree, it, it has to be at a low enough number that you can gradually assimilate the people you do let in, depending on who it is. I mean, if you're letting in PhDs from India, you have a different issue, right? And then the second question was, what do we do with people the, who've been here for 15 years, came in illegally, you know, should we allow them to get permanent status or whatever? Nobody ever argued about whether you just open the border up. I mean, that's why you see quotes from, you know, Clinton and Obama and others saying, well, of course we have to stop illegal immigration. But this is what happens when you don't. I mean, you can't assimilate that many people that quickly. So what you end up doing is dumping them in the towns of small town America uh, in which they're going to where they're going to get in trouble and where you're going to ruin the services and the, and the lives of the people who live in those towns. And you're exact. That's now, their I, policy. I don't know what the talent story is, but the Hewitt story is James Hewitt got on a boat in Ulster in 1868, came to Ellis Island, was sponsored, went to southwestern Pennsylvania and went to work in a coal mine, made enough money to move to Ashtabula, Ohio, buy a farm. His son worked the farm until he went to Capital Law School because an uncle died and left him some money and became a lawyer. And my father became a lawyer and I became, a, I, that's the America, I've got everything for immigrants. But it was one guy alone who was of working age, who was sponsored, came through, did the quarantine the whole night. We, I, I don't know what, I will not be surprised if Donald Trump wins 30 states, 35 states, because well, they can't do you, this. You know, you if I, that's what I meant before. I think I said that the logic of the election favors Trump so much because, number one, you people are hurting, okay? They're yes. hurting because of inflation. They're hurting because of crime. They're hurting because of the border. Number two, they focus on races like the presidency. You know, if, if, if this were a congressional race, people will take a flyer on somebody like Kamala Harris, you know, or whatever. They'll, but on a presidential race, governor's race, mayor's race, they care about it. And number three, the voters understand that Harris owns Biden's policy and owns the last four years. And I don't think there's any way in the world the media can gaslight them enough over the last over the next two months to keep them from understanding that they consistently underestimate the American voter. And then they're shocked and surprised and they say, oh, people are just evil because they didn't vote for the candidate we wanted. No, they, they're, they're hurting because of the Biden-Harris policies and they want real change and they understand that Donald Trump will bring that. That's why I'm, I'm fairly confident about the result. I mean, I, you know, you never know for certain. I don't think the debate mattered that much. I never thought it would. I, I, I think, I thought if she had blown up, it, it might have- It, it would be over. For her. Yeah. yeah. Down on the ticket. other hand, you, they, they, I think that they have figured her out, and if they, those that haven't are going to when they focus between now and the election. We'll see. I mean, I, you know, my political predictions yeah, Jim, are... Yeah, Jim, I was on Larry Kudlow yesterday, and I said, the president did okay, uh, but it wasn't his best. Kamala Harris did the best she could, and it wasn't very good. Fair? I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Look, Trump, the debate, if you go back and watch all of Trump's debate, he's an okay debater, which is what most candidates are, but his strength is the long form interview, like he does with you. 
And the reason is because Trump says what he thinks. So he doesn't, in, in a debate with short periods of time to answer questions, you have to be willing to pivot. You have to be willing to pivot pretty ruthlessly back onto the main topics. And Trump doesn't like to, t- to pivot. He will, you've done this when you interview him. He, he will, if you yeah. lead him into a topic. He gets mad at me when I pivot. Minutes. Right. He'll, he'll take five minutes to discuss it. Now, that's also a tremendous strength because he comes across as what he is, which is authentic. So this kind of a format, even if it had been fair, is not great for Trump. He's an okay debater. I mean, he's, he's not bad. But when you've got three people ganging up on you, you, I mean, you could pick the best debater you've ever seen. And yep. they would have had great trouble in that debate. I mean, I, you know, I yeah. would not have liked to do it. I was a pretty good debater. I would not have liked to do a debate like that. I'd have concentrated on minimizing my losses because it's like it was like the diving competitions in, in the Olympics when the Russians were judges. You weren't going yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that. I'll give you credit. Senator Jim Talent, yeah. always a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Good luck on Dwayne's World this week. And don't go anywhere, America. Stay Keep listening to the podcast. Mike Rogers is running for Senate in Florida. The former FBI agent, the former House member joins me now. Good morning, Mike. I am pleased to have you back. I want to ask you as an FBI agent, uh, are you shocked that a Chinese spy was in the New York governor's office close to two New York governors? And how much damage could such a person do? Yeah, I'd like to say I'm shocked. I'm not. I mean, there is just a lack of perception of risk, I think, on behalf of Democrats. If you remember, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Dianne Feinstein's driver, was found out to have been a Chinese espionage agent, uh, Eric Swalwell from California. Uh, His uh, longtime girlfriend was a Chinese agent. Uh, They are pervasive. You know, the FBI opens up a case every 12 hours on a Chinese espionage case happening in the United States, that's even that's more rapid than um, uh, during the Cold War, the Russians during the Cold War, Hugh. So what the damage they can do, they have a, the new tech, technique and tactic here for the Chinese is to try to slightly influence policy where they can. So imagine doing that from the senior power of the governor's office in New York. Uh, and one of the big things they got out of that, by the way, is there was a Taiwanese delegation coming to visit New York. This uh, Chinese agent was able to work inside of the uh, governor's office to get it canceled. Uh, there's one a great example of the kind of the small things, but these over time can add up. The other thing that- Well, let me do, give you a big one, Congressman, uh, future Senator. If, if her handler gives her a thumb drive and says, make sure the governor sees this and it's got malware, all of the infrastructure of New York Gets that malware. I mean, am I making that up? Is that a draw? I was in Justice Department following the Soviets in the 80s, so I kind of know what they can do, but the internet is new yeah. to me, so I don't know if, if, if compromising an air gap system is in the realm of possibility. Oh, absolutely. She would have access to all of it. And the new technique for the Chinese, Hugh, <clears throat> is, is to have human spies get, uh, get access to credentials so they can break into the networks from Beijing, they don't have to do it, and you know they don't have to sneak in the office and put in the thumb drive. They steal your credentials, and so if you're somebody that at that level, and you walk in and say, "Hey, I need to, you know, what's your password?" and we're we're doing a security check. What's your password uh, for your account and what's your username? Okay, thanks. So I'll get back to you. Okay, everything's fine. They just pan, hand that off to the Chinese handlers, and guess what? They're in that network, and they can go from there to you know they call it island hopping. They can go from that network, the governor's network, to the public service network. That's why this is so dangerous and why we've got to start paying attention to what the Chinese are up to. And it's why you've got to win. It's why you've got to win uh, in Michigan. What is your website, by the way, Congressman? Because it's a high dollar race, but you need small dollar donors. I do. I, I absolutely do. And by the way, money's pouring in. George Soros pouring money. And they're going to try to buy this Senate seat. I need your uh, listeners' help. Rogersforsenate.com. Uh, is is the best place to go. Take a look at the website. Come on, make a sm- small dollars go a long way. So please take a minute. If you believe in democracy and the future of the country, take a minute, get on, help us out. We're just going up on TV and we need your help. And there's no D in Rogers. It's R-O-G-E-R-S, rogersforsenate.com. 
Now, Senator, I, I mean, super Senator, future Senator, I want to ask you about Actually, Admiral Kirby. Your mother Kirby. will say to you from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, I want to go to Admiral Kirby, and I want to repeat. Patriot, veteran, I respect him. Yesterday, he sent an email to staff that he, unfortunately for him, hit reply all on, which demeaned Afghan veterans, saying it's only a handful who are complaining, and indeed, they are all of one stripe, close quote. Uh, they're, they're complaining about the withdrawal of Abigail. Should he resign? Me? Absolutely. Because he's coming from one stripe. He presents himself uh, with his rank. Uh, that's what's so offensive to me. Uh, if he were just an average citizen, said something stupid, you, he probably should get, you know, smacked around a little bit and, and uh, you know, told, you know, counseled, as they say in the Army. Uh, and I would, uh, but I think as somebody as senior as he is, who's pitching day in and day out, uh, you know, the president's agenda uh, and using his rank in that position, I absolutely think he should resign. I mean, talk, I mean he's All a right. Navy guy who is a public affairs officer his whole career, and I get why he might not understand what those soldiers and those families are going through. I get that, but it gets no excuse for him to talk that way about veterans who are concerned about what the disastrous Afghan pullout that resulted in the death of 13 individuals that didn't have to die. I, you know, the more I think about it, the hotter I get about this view. Uh, it's over at Fox News. I've tweeted out. I'm just so angry about it myself. Now, uh, Mike Rogers, uh, I watched the debate on Tuesday night. That night, I thought, okay, Kamala Harris won the battle, but Donald Trump is going to win the war. But now, upon further review, the officials in the booth have reserved, reversed my call on the field. Because it was so biased. It was so bad that I watched all day yesterday. Everybody knows ABC went in the tank. It was three on one. And we were still talking about Springfield, Ohio, and 10 million to 20 million people coming over the southern border. And the economy kind of, I, I think maybe he will have won the debate in a week. What do you think? I think he absolutely won the debate. And I'll tell you why. Kamala Harris com continued to show us her only plan is to tell you she has a plan. And when people are hurting, like real people, are having a hard time buying groceries, you watch that debate, there is no way you could say, I have confidence that she could be A, commander in chief, uh, or B, help me with my problems, right? I mean, a $50,000 loan to a small business to get started when we have biz small businesses all across my state that are hardly making it, that could use a break. I mean, the, the, uh, the just naivety of what she's trying to pitch to the American people as a solution is, is maddening to me. And at the end of the day, they still see the, the border problem. She never answered it. They still see the fact that she's been there for four years and, and has caused our economic pain in our state and, and all around the country. So I do think he won that debate. You know, listen, does everyone, it's, that's like any debate. You wish you go back and go, ooh, oh boy, I wish I'd have thought of saying that. But you know what? At the end of the day, He's been president. His record was at least allowed to come out. The two commentators were in the tank. When they came back and he said uh, you know, that he saw somebody on TV talking about pets getting eaten, they came back and said, oh, no, no, that's not true. Well, that's interesting. How were you so prepared to fact check that particular point? I mean, it's unbelievable how in the tank those, those two were. They fact checked the David uh, President Yost, Trump. David Yost, by never, the way, David Yost, the, once the attorney. Checker. The Attorney General of Ohio put this out yesterday. There's a recorded police call from witnesses who saw immigrants capturing geese for food in Springfield. Citizens testified to city council. These people would be competent witnesses in court. Why does the media find a carefully worded city hall press release better evidence? Dave Yost, a friend of mine. I'm just curious. I didn't know about Springfield until Tuesday night. Fifteen to 20,000 Haitian migrants have been dropped on a city of 58,000 people. Has anything like that happened in Michigan? We haven't seen that number in one place, but we have we have uh, drug uh, cartel gangs operating in southeast Michigan. We have both Chileans, all came across the southern border, uh, and the Colombians. You know, we have an illegal uh, raped a, a, a minor girl in Oakland County, a sexual assault of a minor girl, a, another illegal in Livingston County. An illegal exposed himself in a commercial enterprise to a nine-year-old girl, and by the way, uh, as a law enforcement guy, Hugh, I can tell you that he's on his journey if he hasn't already committed sexual assault. And so you start thinking of what the damage is actually happening in real communities. And we had lost 3,000 people to fentanyl. They don't seem to be interested. 
I mean, certainly the the commentators, I don't think they probably have put gas in their own tank in a very long time because they certainly weren't interested in pressing her on uh, their policies. Oh, they have it. Problem, including the crime you know, Mike, in, the, in, our, in our state. I've lived their lives. I know their lives. They don't put gas in the tank. They never do. They don't go shopping. Let, let me ask you this to close. You've done or are doing debates with your opponent. Are your moderators remotely fair? Because I, I wrote for Fox News this morning. That was the worst debate in the history of presidential debate. And it's not, there wasn't one question on China. There wasn't a question about Hirsch, Goldberg, Pollen. There wasn't a question about the Americans who were murdered on 10-7. There wasn't a question about Iran getting nuclear weapons. Are your moderators that bad? Well, I hope not. Uh, you know, listen, we, we have found in this race that there's not a friendly news outlet. And when I say friendly, I just mean neutral. <laughs> I, I take neutral. Uh, we just haven't found it. But you know what? We're, uh, I think we're going to take the opportunity to present the issues as we know them. And if they're not going to get to the questions, I'll try to m make it known what I think is important for the state in the future. Uh, you know, again, it, it's, it is hard out there because people already have bought in. And when you get everybody bought in uh, against what we're trying to do for the future of the country, it's pretty frustrating. I want you to turn over at Fox News at 310. I'm going to talk about my Fox News column and come back to the Salem News Channel afterwards. But I'm going to talk about my Fox News column. It's the worst presidential debate in history. Not even close. It was so, so very biased. And everyone knows. And uh, I was on Cudlow yesterday. And Larry Kudlow offered me the chance to comment, and I said this, cut number 20. Hugh Hewitt, your take on any of this? Well, I, I want to say kudos on your riff, Larry, because the oldest cliche in news is also true. First reports are usually wrong. Wow, and the you. first reports last night are that, you know, Trump lost, Harris won. Over the course of the day, I have been seeing three things emerge. Trump was okay. Not his best, but he did get in some haymakers. His mm -hmm. closing statement was best. And anytime you're focusing on migration, you're winning. Kamala Harris, by contrast, was at her best, and it wasn't very good. And then third, and I think this matters a lot, it was the worst presidential debate in modern history. <laughs> I do not believe even an independent or even a moderately fair Democrat will conclude other than that was an ambush. And as that settles in, as people study what Alex just referred to, the vice president did not answer one question, nor did ABC, which is owned by Disney, ask one question about China. Not mm. one question. Mm. I was thinking of their theme parks, their merchandising. Yep. I think about the NBA, I didn't talk about China. Mm. Not one question about Iran. They did not bring up our hostage who was executed along with five others mm -hmm. in Israel on the 10th seven. I am so amazed at the unprofessionalism and the, the deeply disrespectful of America, as Katie mentioned, performance by ABC. I think by the weekend, Trump may have won this. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a moving river of opinion that gathers force. And at this point, yeah, I, I wanted more. I wanted perfection. But that was the best the vice president's ever going to be. And she's not very good. Cut number 23. Senator Cruz on with Hannity last night. Well, listen, I'm skeptical that, that Kamala's team will have her do a second debate. I think they're going to back out of that. I think they're going to send her back to Joe Biden's basement. I think we probably will not see Kamala emerge again from the basement, sort of like the groundhog in her shadow. She's not going to come out again from the basement until election night, other than to go to her rallies and read from, from teleprompters. And listen, I got to say tonight, what, what Kamala demonstrated is, number one, she cannot defend her disastrous record. Her record is an absolute train wreck. So instead, what she did, what we saw tonight in this, quote, debate, was her repeating memorized set pieces from her stump speech and from her convention speech. The very opening question, the most important question in any election, are you better off now than you were four years ago? She refused to answer that because she couldn't answer that, because nobody, unless you are a Mexican drug lord, nobody else is better off than they were four years ago. So she didn't answer that. Instead, she's like, I'm from a middle class family. I want things better for you. And no aspect on inflation. She didn't address that she cast the tie-breaking vote on trillions of dollars of spending that caused inflation hurting Americans across this country. 
on energy. She didn't address that she and Joe Biden have waged war on American energy over and over and over again, driving up the cost of gasoline and everything else for Americans. On, on the border, she didn't address her own personal responsibility, the invasion, the crime, the murders, the, the women sexually assaulted, the children brutalized. She didn't take responsibility for any of that. And, and then on foreign policy, I actually thought on foreign policy she was the weakest. It was absurd. When she turned to Donald Trump and says, well, everyone knows you were weak and ineffective. Listen, if Donald Trump were still in the White House, the two wars that broke out under her leadership and Joe Biden's. And Ted Cruz got it. He nailed it. Senator Rick Scott is a friend of mine. He's running for reelection. His website is rickscott.com. He will win. And I'll talk about the race, but I want to begin. Good morning, Senator. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me. Hugh, it is always great to be with you, and thank you for your position. Thank you for being out there and talking about the issues. I want to begin with an issue that focus that popped up this morning. Admiral Kirby is a patriot. He's a veteran. I respect him. But boy, did he miss, make a mistake yesterday. He sent out an email to his staff, and he hit reply all, and it went to Fox News. In it, he uh, was very disrespectful to the Afghan vets who are critical of the Afghanistan withdrawal he said, quote, obviously no use in responding. He called it a handful of vets, indeed, all of one stripe. All of one stripe. Senator Scott, should John Kirby resign? Absolutely. But, but you know, the, I don't know how you would do the job he has um, where you have to, you know, in my opinion, it's, con it's constantly misrepresenting the facts. Afghanistan was an absolute disaster. Uh, Day before yesterday, we did the it was the um, we did the Congressional Gold Medals to the uh, for the service members that lost their lives that day, th you know, three years ago, uh, where they had the bombing at the Kabul airport. And I, I just I, how can you actually act like that was a success? And and Harris brags that she was the last person in the room when Biden made the fateful decision to leave, knowing that nobody agreed with it. So. I just think this country has got to wake up uh, and say that we've got to get better leadership. Uh, Harris can't lead this country. She'll be a disaster. Senator, I began my show this morning with a monologue. I posted over at my YouTube channel that is titled, Upon Further Review, the officials in the booth have reversed the call on the field on the debate. I was among those who thought Kamala Harris won. But I've been watching for a day. Everybody knows ABC was in the tank. The focus is on Spring, Springfield, Ohio. The focus is on the economy. I think Trump's numbers are going to go up by a week from now. What do you think? I agree. But here's, here's my thought. I, you know, I did some press um, for the Trump team before the debate, and I thought Trump's <clears throat> defined, right? We, every, if you don't know about Trump, I mean, you have to be living under a rock, right? Harris is the one who has a lot to explain. He was the borders are. We know the borders open. Uh, she was the one that did the tie-breaking vote for the massive spending bills. We now have inflation. She was next to the Biden when he made the fateful decision to leave Afghanistan, and she thought it was a success. That she didn't. She didn't explain those. This was her, actually this was her opportunity to explain it, and she didn't. Uh, so, if you look at the polls, it sure looks like Trump is doing better than he was in sixteen and twenty, right? And he clearly won in sixteen, and it was. Clearly close in 20. So, I mean, I, th I, think he's, I think he's heading in the right direction, and she's not. The other thing that happened in that debate, I'm from Ohio, and I did not know anything until the debate about Springfield, Ohio. Yesterday, and, and the fact that, it's a fact, between fifteen and 20,000 Haitian migrants have been dropped there in the last three and a half years. The city's only 58,000 people strong. The Attorney General of Ohio yesterday posted, his name is David Yost, he's a friend of mine, I've worked with him, he's a good guy. There's a recorded police call, he tweeted, from a witness who saw immigrants capturing geese for food in Springfield. Citizens testified to the city council. These people would be competent witnesses in court. Why does the media find a carefully worded city hall press release better evidence? I didn't know anything about Springfield, and they talked about, people are going to remember they're eating the dogs. I don't care if they're eating the dogs. I care about the fact they put 20,000 Haitians in a city of 58,000 people. It's insane. It's insane. You know, we, first off, we have a great Haitian community in Florida. 
Of course um, you do. Yeah. Great, but to bring 20,000 immigrants, it doesn't matter where they're from, 20,000 people into a town of 58,000 people, that's going to cause issues. Um, that's not the way immigration ought to be done in this country. We should, we should have a reasonable amount of immigration. It should be legal immigration. People should be vetted. We don't want drugs, criminals, terrorists coming across into our country. And so I think what Trump did uh, was he highlighted the problem. We have been invaded by, by, by people. Some of them are wonderful people, but 20,000 people in a town of 58,000 people, that's an invasion. Now, now, Senator Scott, I thought Donald Trump got angry. And as I explained to Larry Kudlow yesterday, he was right to be angry. He was being ambushed. And I wrote for Fox News this morning. That was the worst presidential debate in the history of presidential debate. I've done five presidential primary debates with networks. These things are scripted and rehearsed. That was awful, Muir and Davis. What did you think of their performance? Well, even the co-chair of the uh, you know, presidential debate commission said the same thing. It was a disaster. I mean, what I don't understand about journalists is, and, and this, this happened to me, actually happened to me in, in Philadelphia, a guy came up to me, a journalist from somewhere, and he started asking the question and giving me the answer. And I finally said to him, why don't you just talk to yourself? Because huh? you, 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 know the, you, you know the answer. Well, these guys, they, they, you know, they uh, fact check Trump, but not fact check Harris. I mean, that's not the way this is supposed to work. Uh, Senator, the most glaring omission, I put this in the column, I'll ask you, there was not one question about China. China is our, is our enemy. There was a genocide of the Uyghurs. They are threatening Taiwan. They have repressed uh, uh, Hong Kong. Jimmy Lai is in jail. They had a spy in the governor's office in New York. God knows what she did. Uh, do you think Disney told them because of their theme parks and their merchandise they can't bring up China? Makes sense, right? Oh, and let's remember, 76,000 uh, people died last year of fentanyl overdose. Precursors come from China. On top of the fact they've never complied with the rules of the World Trade uh, Organization, they, don't, they didn't comply with any trade deals. They didn't comply with the Trump trade deal. I mean, they lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, they want to destroy our way of life. They sent a spy balloon across the country. They got a spy station in Cuba. I mean, we could go on and on. And not one question about the person, the country, the government of the country that wants to destroy your way of life. They want to destroy your opportunity to live the American dream. They want to destroy us and nothing. And by the administration, it's been the biggest appeaser. And you, they, they've appeased Iran. They've appeased, uh, appeased China, Cuba, Nicar uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela. In Venezuela, they're allowing them to sell oil after they stole the election. You get sick and tired of this stuff when you look at what this administration has done. Biden and Harris don't care about us. They, they want to be friends with the whole socialist world, the totalitarian world out there. It makes you mad. Uh, Ten days before this debate, an American citizen, Hirsch Goldberg Pollan, who's also an Israeli citizen, was executed by an Iranian proxy. Not only was Hirsch not brought up or the other five hostages or the Americans killed on 10-7, Iran wasn't brought up. I, 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 no. What do you think about that? Who, who? I've done these. They're scripted. What do you think they were thinking? Well, they're, they're thinking, how do we help Harris and how do we hurt Trump? That's what that was. That was the whole agenda that night. Um, but I mean, think about it. Biden and Harris. They don't. They will never talk about the hostages. And, and what maybe Hirsch would be alive today if Biden and Harris hadn't held back the weapons uh, to Israel. I mean, it is, these are these are American citizens being held hostage, and we're given money that goes directly to Hamas. Who in their right mind is doing this? Building, building a, a, a pier so they can get, uh, get uh, more uh, stuff to, to the Gazans so the money can go to Hamas so they can build more tunnels, buy more weapons, kill more Americans. This is stupidity, stupidity what's going on with this administration. All right, my last question for you, uh, Senator, has to do with your race. Uh, I think you're going to win pretty easily, but they're pouring a lot of money to try and beat you. What are the dynamics down there? I, it's a very red state because it's full of people who like freedom. You got a great governor. You got a good colleague in Marco Rubio. You are a leader in the Senate. What What are they trying to do to you? Because I I see appeals on my timeline from your opponent for my. Of course, that's just because they're everywhere. 
there must be a lot of dark money. What's going on in your race? So what they're doing is my my opponent my opponent is a complete socialist. She was she was she voted with AOC, <clears throat> Leave, and Omar when she had two her two years in Congress. So she's she's trying to sell the guy Harris. They're both trying to say, oh no, we're not like that at all. Don't worry about how we voted or what we said. So yeah, they're they're pouring money in. They're running ads. They're lying about their record. So I'm traveling the state. I've been to every county. I'm continuing to travel. I hope to get to almost every county again. Uh, so I'm just doing what I did as governor in my Senate race. I talk to people every day, and and that's how we're gonna we're gonna outwork them and we're gonna win. Well, you're talking to them in Tampa, Sarasota, all across Florida right now, Jacksonville, Orlando. And I hope they go to rickscott.com and just find you're a great senator, and I hope they know that. Thank you, Senator, for joining me. I appreciate Thank it. You have a great day. Bye bye. You too. Many of you have been asking me in a lighthearted way, how's Genghis Kate doing? I have many wonderful grandchildren, I'm about to get a new one. And uh, that's great. Uh, Genghis Kate is the pirate of the bunch. There's always the scholar, firstborn, and then there's always a Genghis Kate. I love them all the same, of course, but Genghis Kate is funniest. Uh, and Genghis Kate is now five, and she has joined a soccer team. T-Rex Teddy is, is very upset that he doesn't get soccer cleats. He cries whenever she puts them on. I just have a question for you. How many red cards do you think Genghis Kate's going to get in her career? I, I just think it's going to... She went to kindergarten like a pirate board in a ship. Ahoy, matey, grab a cutlass and a pistol and let's go in. And now she's attacking soccer the same way. And I, you know, I don't think they have red card in five-year-old soccer. I don't know. But if they do, she's going to set a record. She's going to set a record. When she was three, she told a kid that was arguing over there at the playground that he needed to... to get himself together and have a timeout because <laughs> I just, there is greatness in the world, even on dark days. Now, I want to go back to a few things, right? Number one thing, the backlash against ABC is the most I have ever seen. And it is growing. It is everywhere. Howard Kurtz is the best media critic. Not just me. I'm going to be on Martha McCollum today because my new Fox News column is the worst debate in American history. Most biased, three against one. And the effect it's having is that it's calling attention to the fact that Kamala Harris did not answer any question. It's calling attention to Springfield, Ohio. It's calling attention to the inflation that was there when they got there, which was 1%. It's calling attention to everything Kamala Harris. And the Kamala Harris thinks she won. I thought she had won. I was wrong. The, the officials in the booth, upon further review, have reversed the call on the field. And Howard Kurtz summarized it better than I did. Here's Howard Kurtz yesterday, cut 25. ABC gets a D minus, and that's being generous. In fact, the network's moderators were so blatantly biased against Donald Trump that it indicated that his pregame criticism of ABC as dishonest, putting aside Kamala Harris's aggressive performance, uh, the moderators, David Muir and Lindsey Davis, asked much tougher questions of the former president, repeatedly followed up and corrected, as you said, uh, his responses on five occasions. For the vice president, the figure was zilt. For instance, when Harris was asked about her abandoning her previous left-wing positions on opposing fracking and uh, abolishing private health insurance, she danced around the questions uh, and uh, said that these things were untrue. She said things that were untrue with no fact-checking by ABC. The same goes for the VP's out-of-context charge that Trump had warned of a bloodbath if he loses. Now, when Harris said things that were false, such as that Trump is actively pursuing the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, which he has repeatedly disavowed, there was no challenge from ABC. Under Trump... Couples who pray and, 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 and dream of having a family are being denied IVF treatments. Actually, Trump has been a leading advocate of IVF treatments, even saying they should be free. But the former president was constantly pressed on whether he regrets anything he did on January 6th or whether he wants Ukraine to win the war against Russia. Now, there were times when the fact-checking was appropriate, such as when Trump rep repeated, excuse me, a debunked claim that Haitian immigrants in Ohio were eating pets. 
but it was generally so one-sided as to support Trump's complaint. The debate very much felt like three against one. I don't know that Howard Kurtz has seen David Yost, the Attorney General of Ohio, yet uh, about the pets. He should have said geese, not dogs or pets, because the geese thing there's evidence for. So it really isn't a good fact check. But Howie will catch up with Howie. I'll be on Martha McCollum today talking about it. I just want you to go that to that Morning Glory column over at foxnews.com. Go to foxnews.com. The column is, is titled Morning Glory. I write for Fox News Tuesdays and Thursdays. I have a column in the Post coming up on Monday. So I just like to write. It was the worst debate in the history of presidential debate. And I am, I think, among conservatives, the most experienced with national news debates among presidential contenders. I've done five of them. I know how they're done. They are scripted. They are rehearsed. They don't control my questions. I do battle test my questions and make sure they work. I throw some out. There are 50 people in the room, every executive. China was only mentioned once by candidate, never by the moderators, never. No Uyghurs, no Taiwan, no Hong Kong, no Jimmy Lai, no spying, nothing. The one thing that came up that was tariffs, and China doesn't like the tariffs. I really think we've got to look into whether they were told not to bring up China. Like the NBA silencing the general manager of the Houston Rockets when he criticized China. It's a big market. American corporations need to do business there. That deserves it.